Welcome, welcome back to the show. It's been quite a minute. And for this holiday season this year, I've invited Jean Bajelon onto the show to discuss this year's most inflammatory holiday topic, Israel-Palestine. Uh, this is something I had only planned to do a video on if I could bring someone on who I trust. And when it comes to the Middle East, especially concerning Israel and Palestine, I basically don't trust anybody. So, uh, Jean Bajlan is someone who I do trust on this topic. I'm most familiar with Jean's work as a media figure, speaking on the topics of nationalism and various other topics related to Kurdish issues. Uh, unsurprisingly, it turns out that those are the specializations he teaches about in university. So, uh, so uh, unlike me, he's graduated from numerous schools, um, University of London, London School of Economics, Istanbul, Bilgi University, mm -hmm. and University of Oxford. Um, and now you're teaching at Missouri State University, right? That's correct. In the Queen City of the Ozarks, Springfield, Missouri, the largest Springfield in the United States. <laughs> well, that's a claim to fame. Mm -hmm. Um so in the show notes, I'll put links to your work and some videos. Um, you know, obviously, uh, I've seen a lot of you either on Derek Vaughn's show or on This Is Revolution. Um, but I did see you have a whole bunch of writing, a couple books that you've worked on, too. So I want to make sure that's accessible to people. Yeah. And um, if anybody wants access to anything that I've written uh, that they can't get access to, just shoot me an email on my university email. And I'm always happy to share my work with people for free. Oh, that's very kind. Yeah. <laughs> I don't get paid for it. So you shouldn't have to pay for it either. That's my philosophy. That's, I thought that's typical in uh, of academic writing, isn't it? Oh yeah. It's typical of academic writing. People don't really get paid for it. People might get research grants to write papers and et cetera, et cetera, but you don't usually get paid for writing an article, at least in my field. Uh, so, you know, you can spend six months writing a thousand word, uh, you know, 10,000 word, very detailed article, get paid nothing for it. Plop out, you know, 700 words for, I don't know, Newsweek and you get like 250 bucks for it. So, uh, yeah. Academics are working hard, but they aren't working smart. Yeah, it's uh, quite a bit of a mess. Um, before getting to the actual topic uh, itself, I'm curious about how you wound up focusing on nationalism for your research, because for me, studying nationalism has been the consequences of a bunch of different factors. I'm a Jew. I'm an anarchist. I'm interested in social psychology and modern history. And throughout my life in the United States, the sense of national feeling or national consciousness has always been a mystery to me. So well, it's kind of interesting because there are a lot of a lot of very important theoreticians of nationalism who wrote on nationalism came from Jewish backgrounds, but not just Jewish backgrounds, but highly cosmopolitan Jewish backgrounds. People like Eric Hobsbawm, Eli Kaduri, uh, you know, just to name but a few. I'm. Um, Everybody else is like spinning out of my head at the moment. I can't remember any, but there is, there are, oh, Anthony D. Smith, another theoretician of nationalism, all of Jewish backgrounds, all from quite like mobile uh, families who moved across Europe because of the rise of nationalism and the persecution of the Jewish uh, population. So, you know, these were people who did not fit neatly into national categories during the process of nation building. Uh, you know, they were, you know, Jewish people in Central and Eastern Europe were often seen as being outside of the nation as unassimilate, uh, you know, as, as, as a group to be expelled or assimilated or converted, but not truly part of the nation. Although, of course, many Jewish intellectuals played important parts in the formation of nationalism in Central Europe as well, including in places like Hungary. Uh, but, you know, that's beside the point. And I find myself in quite sympathy with a lot of those people. Uh, you know, I'm half Kurdish, half Welsh, brought up in Northern England, educated in Britain, in Turkey, live in the United States. I'm married to a half Persian, half American woman who is raised in Iran and then came to America at 18. 
nationalism and a strong sense of like loyalty to the nation, <clears throat> both to myself and to my broader family life, to my family, is it's kind of a little bit bizarre, right? We are kind of cosmopolitans in a sense, moving through places. And I guess that's always been to a certain degree, um, you know, something on my mind about like identity and what it means. And I became interested in university and studying about, you know, identity, nation formation, identity formation, not just for like a personal reason, but because it's so important in current politics. You know, the nation, we live in a world of nations. We think in national terms, uh, you know, we, you know, the the theoretician of nationalism, uh, Billings, you know, talks about something called banal nationalism, where everyday way of your life, the radio shows you listen to, you know, the the swimming award you get at the age of 15 years old from the English Swimming Association, all these things help us to, you know, reinforce a kind of national way of thinking, which is very significant for politics and, uh, you know, is very important, but is often assumed by many people just to be a kind of natural fact of hum the human condition, where in fact, when we look at nations, nation formation it is a relatively recent ideology, one that came into being, you know, in early modern Europe, perhaps had its antecedents in early modern Europe at the very least, and then really comes into its own in, in, in the 19th and early 20th century. And over the course of this last 200 years, has transformed the global political order into a political order of nation states. Right. And, you know, yeah, so this is going to immediately launch us into the first uh, series of things I wanted to talk about. Um so the reason I reached out to you for this is because I saw a post you made about Zionism and, and and Israel, where you said, I think it is probably better to talk about Israeli nationalism as opposed to Zionism. Zionism seems to obfuscate the core of the issue for both Zionists and anti-Zionists. And I think this is something that I agree with. And I also think that there's a lot to unpack there and to make sense of it. Um, the way that I'd like to do that is by going over some of the important terms mm -hmm. that are circulating in the Israel-Palestine discourse and get some clarity on what they mean, uh, not just denotatively, but also connotatively, uh, where applicable. So if we have some time after that, I know there's a lot more that we could talk about, but I've just been so frustrated with the way that terminology has been mangled and that I don't have any confidence in the ability for people to really think through this situation without beginning from uh, an elementary knowledge. So what are some of your thoughts just about, about that? Are you as triggered as I am about all the gibberish that, that circulates? I mean, yeah, I think a lot of people are, for example, m misapplying terminology or using unhelpful analogies with the Israel-Palestine conflict, or perhaps more accurately projecting their own political way of thinking, especially in the United States, onto the Middle East. So, for example, uh, you know, a lot of people, it, progressives in the United States, will project the kind of white people versus people of color conflict onto the Israel-Palestine conflict, but that doesn't really make sense, right? That isn't right. the root of the issue. Of course, there are racialized aspects of this conflict, no doubt, but the key fault line is not racial, right? There are Ethiopian Jewish people who are black and who have better, better political rights than uh, Palestinians. Um, of course, within the Israeli Jewish community, there are uh, fissures along, you know, racial, cultural, historical lines. You know, this you have the Ashkenazi Jewish community who was at the vanguard of the foundation of the state of I I Israel, but also you have this con uh, concept of Mizrahi Jewish communities, which in itself is actually a kind of uh, racialized term developed, you know, by Ashkenazis to refer to a whole load of quite different uh, Jewish communities. You know, we have terms like Sephardic uh, Jewish communities, which has a kind of, uh, it has a, it has a, a, yes, a geographical and historical aspect to it, but it's also 
partly a theological way of reading the Torah, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, even within Israel, of course, there are racial fissures, but the core of this problem is not black people versus white people. It's a, it's a sectarian conflict in which religion, uh, a secularized, a secularized form of religious identity in many cases, but religion is the key kind of dividing line of the conflict. So I think sometimes the projection of this like white versus uh, people of color is kind of a misunderstanding. And another aspect is the use of settler colonialism, which I think is a useful paradigm for understanding the formation of the state of Israel. But when you say, oh, well, all these Israelis should go back to Brooklyn, you're forgetting that, yes, although, you know, that there is a strong European settler colonial aspect to this proje project after 1948, uh, the expulsion of the Middle East and Jewish communities, that looks a lot more like the kind of ethnic unmixing that you saw in the Balkans in the 19th century with Muslims and Christians expelling each other. And many of the most hardcore Zionists, like Ben Gavir is from Iraqi Kurdistan. I call him my Kurdish brother. And, uh, you know, uh, many of these people, the most hardcore elements of, uh, of the Zionist movement are from these, uh, these groups that were expelled from the Arab countries and who don't have somewhere to go back to, right? Uh, you know, so settler colonialism is a useful paradigm, but uh, it can be used to, it can be overly used to, uh, you know, to kind of totalize what the Israeli political project is. I like to call Israel settler colonialism with Balkan characteristics, right? Which is, you know, you have a, certainly a, a settler colonial aspect to the project, but also, you know, that's just one aspect of this project. There are some distinctive aspects uh, of the Israeli nation building project. And, you know, this comes more broadly down to the question of settler colonialism. Right. Settler colonialism is a bloody brutal way of nation building, but it's not the only bloody brutal way of nation building. It's one of the, one of the weird things of Western civilization. I often find is like the um, squeamishness about certain things which turn out to be the same. So like poison gassing someone is a terrible way to kill them and is a war crime, but just blowing them up with a high explosive, same result, they're dead, probably more painfully, um, is somehow kind of uh, worse, you know, uh, is somehow better than using poison gas and stuff. So certainly colonialism is a atrocious uh, process, but it's a historical process connected with the you know, nation building, and we've seen different uh, processes of nation building, which are often very bloody and violent as well. And we need to look at it in those terms, because what does it mean? Okay, yes, Israel is a settler colonial population, but this isn't Algeria in 1960 in it too, right? You're not going to kick out the entire Jewish population. Uh, and so, you know, thinking of it in that way, uh, in a kind of moralistic way rather than an analytical way, because that's what it becomes. It becomes a kind of moralistic term rather than an analytical term. Uh, doesn't really help us get anywhere with our understanding of this uh, particular conflict. And then finally, that brings me to the question of Zionism. Well, there are a couple of objections to why we might... Well, there's a couple of reasons why we want to use Israeli nationalism as opposed to Zionism. Firstly, as historical, Zionism as a movement had various different iterations before the state creation of the state of Israel, some of which looked towards binational, um, uh, a binational state where Israel, uh, where Jewish people and Palestinian people could live together. Some were purely cultural uh, 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 nationalists who sought like a cultural national revival. And of course, then you have revisionist Zionism. You have like uh, the state-based uh, Zionism as well. But why I find the term somewhat misleading is because for both pro-Zionist people and anti-Zionist people, it sets up uh, Zionism as a sui generis phenomenon, like that it's something very like special and specific. For the pro-Zionist people, it's something that is, it's a nationalism, it's an ethnic nationalism, but that they will go to bat for, right? They wouldn't right. go to bat for for any other kind of exclusive ethno-religious nationalism, but they will do for Zionism for, the, for, for various reasons. And then on the anti-Zionist uh, uh, front, you have people who act as if this is like the only conflict in the entire universe, and um, 
who, you know, treat Zionism as some kind of sui generis evil, when in fact it needs to be understood within the com complex of nation formation and the formation of national identity, both in Europe and also uh, in the Middle East. Because, of course, historically Zionism meant different things to different people. To reiterate right. that point, you know, what Zionism meant to Jews in Europe during the 19th century was very different from what it meant to Jews in the Ottoman Empire, for example. And or or even what it might mean now to an American Jew who just has this sort of vague, uh, this means I support Israel kind of idea. And so therefore they'll latch on to the word and just think it it's a vague description of, you know, the political application of being Jewish or something like that. But why I say we should use Israeli nationalism is, is because with the formation of the state of Israel, you have Zionism becoming, you know, uh, formalized as an official nationalism of a state. And that state is the state of Israel. That state of Israel is in a, pro uh, is in a process of nation building, right? And it is promoting this, what Benedict Anderson calls a kind of official nationalism uh, of, the uh, of, of the country. And of course, part of that nationalist project is to win the support of the Jewish diaspora. Perhaps right. one of the weird aspects, I like to think of Israeli nationalism and Zionism as a normal nationalism, but instead when they were sticking it together, they put the wires on the outside. So it looks a little bit different from another nationalism, but it's actually the same. It's just the wiring is on the outside. And um, so it's become the official ideology of the state of Israel. Uh, and Although the state of Israel it tries to elide the concept of like an Israeli loyalty to the Israeli nation state, to uh, tries to kind of impose that on the global Jewish community, uh, I think uh, it is it's a dangerous thing for for let's say people critical of Israel and, and Zionism to kind of take that framing. So we should actually focus this as being this is. Israeli state nationalism, right? This is what it is. And Israeli state nationalism involves nation building inside Israel, but also kind of a process of nation building amongst the diaspora. That's why you get to go to your birthright trip, have you, you know, you have sex with some IDF soldiers so you can, you know, get an emotional attachment to the state of Israel. You know, this kind of whole stuff. This is a nation building project. Nothing, there's nothing weird about it in a general sense, this is what nations do. It's just that the way the Israeli state came into being. And so uh, I think we should avoid, you know, using Zionism when we're talking about the state nationalism of Israel, because it isn't Jewish nationalism per se. It is the nationalism now of an Israeli nation state. Right. And not all Jewish people buy into that political project. Not all Jewish people see their identity as a racial identity. Uh, some see it as spiritual. Some, you know, some do see it as like cultural and things like that. And so, you know, I would be very hesitant to be talking. Now, we might say that Israeli nationalism is a is a variant comes out of the Zionist movement, but it is a very specific ideology now that is as tied to a state. So, that's, you know, yeah. So, and and that's. That, that's the critical aspect that I want to get across. Um, I want to circle around back to some of these more abstract reasons that you're giving right now. And when I say abstract, I'll know what I mean in a second when I say the next thing. Um, I kind of want to just start from two different categories of terminology. Mm -hmm. One is the category of who are the people involved in all this? So what is, what does it mean to say you're an Arab? What does it mean to say you're a Jew? What does it mean to say you're Palestinian? These are like one set of questions. And then how do, what exactly is nationality as opposed to ethnicity or uh, race or religion? And just how, you know, these two things interact with each other and then the other set of questions is the political questions what is the difference between civic nationalism ethnic nationalism 
how are those different from like all the pan ideas like pan arabism pan africanism pan european pan american um just to kind of tease and then what is cosmopolitanism mm-hmm. so i think we sort of have to begin just at what what do we even mean when we say arab or jew or palestinian because that already seems to make people's heads explode trying to explain it sure i mean like a lot of these terminologies have to be looked at historically as well because they mean different things in different historical eras you know obviously the term arab was used has been used extensively but you know often in the pre-modern era it was used specifically to refer to uh, uh, nomadic groups, Bedouin communities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, obviously, it was used in the linguistic context to talk about the Arabic language, um, and but in the modern era, obviously, Arab, the concept of an Arab has been sort of um, reinvented as like a nation, a people, a potential people. Uh, you know, not all people who claim an Arab identity would necessarily see their Arab identity as being their national identity, but some people will see it as their national identity because, uh, you know, what makes a national, you know, people, you know, people of the same cultural group may have very different ideas of what nation that they're, what nation they're a part of. You know, uh, you could, you could be, for example, in the 20th century, you could be a Jewish person who is like, no, I reject Zionism because I'm a patriotic Hungarian, right? And how dare you not include me in the Hungarian nation? Whereas you could have someone else lives right next door to that same Hungarian nationalist who's like, no, I'm not a Hungarian. I'm I, I, I'm part of a Jewish nation. Jewish people are a nation, uh, not a religion. You know, again, people can envisage that identity in different ways. And, you know, um, have a completely different political orientation. So, you know, these historical ethnonyms, as it as it were, you know, they mean different things in different contexts at different uh, historical eras. But in the modern era, they become, or they there is a process whereby there is a, a self conscious effort to constitute them as a nation, as a people. And what do we mean by a nation? Well, you know, Benedict Atkinson has that famous word, you know, the imagined community, which actually I don't think is the most interesting part of his definition. He talks about an imagined community, which is uh, which is inherently limited in scope and sovereign in nature. So what that tells us is the process of becoming a nation is both internal to the nation, to a community, but also as a global phenomena whereby the world is being redefined and identity be, is being redefined in quote unquote national terms, which means that's something that everybody has to come to terms with. Once the world is nationalized, well, you have to, uh, you know, are you a part of this nation or that nation? In the pre modern era, it's very, you know, identities are very flexible. You know, people move between, uh, uh, move between identities. That's still true in the modern era. But for a whole bunch of reasons related to capitalism, the bureaucratic state, et cetera, et cetera, suddenly it becomes there's a process of reifying identity. And you have to pick a national identity, you have to pick a nation to be a part of. And for some people, uh, the, the 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 political and cultural nation, uh, a single you know entity, you know that's the kind of one flag, one nation, uh, you know, one flag, one language one homeland kind of nationalism. But then you have, you know, uh, people who have a little, perhaps a little bit more of a complicated idea that who kind of bifurcate their identity between, let's say, what they might think is the organic, quote unquote, organic ethnic, their ethnic identity and their political national identity, where they separate the cultural from the political, where they are, you know, part of a cultural nation, but that cultural nation is a component of a, Cosmo, cosmopolitan or multinational civic uh, uh, nation based on perhaps uh, shared political institutions like in the United States, a shared religion, you know, like in a place like Turkey, uh, a shared sense of civilization, as in the case of China, right? But what matters about 
uh, what is defining about a nation is the idea that it is inherently limited, right? It is an, and it's inherently part of a world of nations, right? Right. And if and if you look at like uh, you know Mazzini early early liberal nationalists, they saw you know the nation as being you know a, a, a Europe of independent nations as being the solution to uh, conflict, which they saw as being driven by the a naked ambitions of monarchs. Whereas you know n n nations are popular entities; they are the people uh, and um, you know, you could have a world of nation states where the people would peacefully interact with each other rather than, you know, a, a world of monarchs where their greed and ambition would take precedent. Obviously, subsequently, um, the nation as a concept has been appropriated by the political right. Once the old elitism of the past became politically untenable, the nation actually turned out to be a very useful ideological construct because it allowed an autocrat to rule in the name of the people without uh, claiming a popular sovereignty, without offering liberal representation. So it became a kind of, nation's a kind of a contradictory thing in that it is both, it, it is a kind of Frankenstein from the concept of a universal citizenship Mm -hmm. and the peculiarities of romanticism and its attempt to squish those two ideas together. Sometimes the balance is more on the idea of kind of, um, let's say, voluntaristic national identity, shared political institutions, shared homeland, uh, shared history, sometimes, you know, more on that quote unquote civic side of nationalism. And then at other times it might be more organic in understanding what we like to think of as ethnic identities based on mythologies to do with blood, perhaps sectarian group, uh, race, uh, language uh, as an organic expression of, of, of the uh, will. So, you know, what the nation, you know, what cultural artifacts the nation is imagined from varies from case to case. But and even within the same nationalist movement, there'll be like very big conflicts over who gets to be part of the nation, right? Secular Arab nationalists have a very different idea from, let's say, Islamist Arab nationalists of of, of who is part of the Arab nation uh, as well. So these these are projects always in contention, and they're uh, always in a process of flux. But it's not, you know, you have a tendency, you have a, a school in the study of nationalism, which, you know, is, we could, might call the ultra modernists who say it's all just made up in the modern era, right? Uh, it's all like the historical past is irrelevant uh, because this is all just fabricated and it's just a trompe de oeil, uh, you know, that it seems that there's a historical link with the pre-modern era. I wouldn't go so far that, uh, that far, but what I would say is nation building and, and, and what cultural artifacts get picked up on uh, as being the defining point of membership of a nation uh, to a certain extent arbitrary and contingent, but they're not random, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so, for example, the fact that religion became so important in the Middle East is uh, as a kind of defining aspect of nationalism is to a certain degree arbitrary, right? Uh, 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 sorry, is, is, is arbitrary, but it's not random. Right? right, given the way historically Middle Eastern society was organized, you know the 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 millet system, the communal autonomy of different religious communities, it's not an accident that religion became a really important cultural artifact in defining membership of a nation, even when it became secularized. And I, what I mean by that is like in 1923, when the Republic of Turkey and the Kingdom of Greece agreed to a population exchange the mutual ethnic cleansing, the grounds upon which people were shipped out of Greece and people were shipped out of Turkey was not language. It wasn't even ethnicity because, uh, for example, in central Anatolia, you had the Karamanlı, who were pure Turkish tribe. Everybody knew that they were pure, you know, ethnically Turkish tribe, but they were Orthodox. So mm -hmm. deported, right. deported to Greece. So, you know, even in a secularized con context, religion becomes uh you know becomes uh, 
the defining part of nation, nationality. You even see this with the Armenian question where re religion becomes racialized, as it has been in the Jewish case. In the 1890s, there were a series of pogroms uh, 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 launched by uh, Kurdish tribal militias uh, who were theoretically under the control of the Ottoman government. Now, a number of many Armenians were able to escape those pogroms through conversion to Islam. However, in 1915, when the genocide was executed by the uh, uh, young Turks towards the uh, Armenian population, they refused to allow conversion as a way to escape massacre because the concept of religion had become almost racialized. I mean, uh, uh, you see this, uh, the one of the former uh, uh, Turkish intelligence uh, operatives who wrote a memoir I remember really striking was he was writing about a uh, Turkish nationalist who was a Muslim but who'd converted from uh, Judaism. And he said, yeah, you can still tell he's a Jew because he's like always haggling with the carpet guys in the, he just can't, he just can't help haggling, you know? So, so these kind of religious things become racialized as well. So when we talk about, you know, ethnic, ethnic is not kind of a, a more authentic identity to a national identity. Right. Ethnic is a way of understanding that identity as being organic, as being blood-based, as opposed to what we might think of a civic identity. I mean, you could see this, let's say, with Turkish nationalism. You might have Turkish nationalists, you know, the, who really like Ataturk, and they say, Ataturk has the saying, Nam mutlu Turkum diyene, which means happy as he who calls himself a Turk which is like opening the door, like you could be from a different ethnic, you could be from Bosnia, you could be from Circassia, you could be, you know, a Muslim from Albania, but you know, you're a Turk, you can assimilate into this Turkish culture. But then you'll have other people say, no, it's like, actually it's blood. It's blood, it's a, uh, you know, it's a blood and uh, race matter, right? It, 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 you know, like, so, and, and what is ethnic depends on context, right? If you right. go to Britain, you'll say, oh, this person is an ethnic Indian. Well, in India, he's not an ethnic Indian. He'd be an ethnic something else within that context. Yeah, and, and uh, exactly. So another, another situation is like with the Ethiopian Jewish immigration to Israel. They're, uh, apparently in Ethiopia, they were used to a colorism that was based on red, brown, or something else. And then they all of a sudden found themselves being considered black, which they never thought of at all uh, because they had that other kind of color division. Yeah, I mean, you see this with a lot of people from Latin America who turn up in the United States and like, whoa, I'm, uh, I thought I was a white guy, you know? What, what, what's all this about? I'm not a white guy. So yeah, uh, so yeah like, like a lot of these things become, uh, are, are like highly contextual. So when we think of the term ethnic, it's important not to assume like there's something called national identity, but there's something kind of deeper called ethnicity. Rather, it's pro it's a, a better way to think of it is that I you know identities can be envisioned in different ways, sometimes more voluntaristic, and sometimes you know more objectivist, like you are what you are. And you see this in the debates in nationalism in the 19th century. You have Ernst Renan, he has a famous article, C'est quoi une nation? Uh, which is uh, which basically says you know it's a voluntaristic entity, where you have uh, you know German nationalists focusing perhaps more on blood language uh, uh, etc. at the same period of time, and then of course you have the socialists trying to split the baby by right. you know, when when you have Stalin and Lenin trying to define a nation, you know they 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 their definition of a nation, which is echoed in a lot of academic works. Uh, and most notably someone like, especially Vivarians like Anthony D. Smith, uh, who mix both objective criterias and subjective criterias of defining a nation. That is like, oh, there are these cultural artifacts like shared language, shared homeland, et cetera. These are objective, but then there's like a shared sense of history, a shared sense of common. Well, those are subjective aspects uh, 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 of a nation. Um, so, you know, you have this kind of uh, tension and that's a tension that exists within nationalist movements between more liberal civic iterations of nationalist movements 
and more organicist nations uh, 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 conceptions of national community. So what were what, what were some of the external pressures in you know the the 19th century, 20th century for so many different people to take up this project of conceptualizing themselves as nationalities, whereas before identities were definitely much different under different empires. And, you know, I know, I don't remember if it's Benedict Anderson who has the idea of print, the printing print press. Cap leading. Print capitalism, yes. Uh, but yeah, so what were some of these external pressures? Why do we see this happen, you know, everywhere from, you know, Europe to the Middle East to, uh, you know, eventually the rest of the world? Uh, what was what? What's going on with all that? I mean, there are lots of, you know, so in the modernist school of, uh, you know, nationalism theory, you know, you have, you have scholars who def, you know, emphasize different elements of the modern process of modernization. John Bruley talks about the bureaucratic state. Um, uh, and Skalna talks about like industrialism, um, you know, Anderson, print capitalism, vernacularization, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you, you have the Marxists talk about the ideology of rising capitalism, right? Um, I mean, I think a lot, all those theories have like some merit to them. Um, but I think more broadly, it can be just, con you know, it can be conceptualized as a response to, uh, quote unquote, the rise of bourgeois society. Right, the destruction of peculiarism, the formation of sort of national capitalism in some places in in the quote unquote old nations of Europe, in 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 Western Europe in particular, you know you had that process of economic and cultural integration over an extended geographical period taking place prior to kind of the formation of national identity, but you know uh, just as capitalism. And industrial capitalism spread in the world, you know, around the world in the kind of, you know, to use the Trotskyist term, the combined uneven development of that. The same as with nationalism. Nationalism yeah. um, emerges gradually over the early modern period um, and more precipitously after the, you know, French uh, Revolution. And then in the revolutions of 1848. Uh, you know, as a kind of defining ideology of the European system. And because that European system becomes the nucleus of a global system, uh, that concept of nationalism becomes critical. In some places, uh, and this is, this is a, 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 a good way to think about it, the, uh, John Bruley, who, who focuses on the bureaucratic state as the kind of mechanism through which the nation comes into being, you know, talks about the functions of nationalism. I mean, you know, what role is it playing in politics at different moments in time? And he talks about three different ways. He talks about legitimization, coordination, and mobilization. So, you know, in some cases, nationalism is being used, let's say, by elites, not to mobilize their own constituency. Their constituency might be mobilized for completely different reasons. They're pissed off about taxes. They don't like the central government taking them off to conscription. You know, uh, they don't like the different religious group or whatever. But when elites are interfacing with the international community, which thinks in national terms, they use nationalism and it becomes a reinforcing loop because once the state is created, a good example uh, that Bruley uses is, you know, Greece. The Greek uprising was more of a kind of attempt to restore the Byzantine Empire at the beginning. But once the, and, and the key military element of the Greek rebellion were Albanians. But once the state, you know, uh, once the Greek revolutionary leaders are interacting with the Europeans, right, well, they're using that language of nationalism. So it can be an out, it could be a language used by uh, elites to, to speak to an outside, you know, speak to a global community that thinks in national terms. It could be an ideology in terms of coordination, whereby you have different elite groups which have, uh, you know, different economic and historical you know, interests. But nationalism serves as a kind of um, uh, ideological glue to bring them together.
And then at other times, you might talk about nationalism as a mobilizing force, where it becomes a, 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 an ideology used to bring previously, you know, uh, marginalized communities into the political process, mobilizing the peasantry into the political process, the working class, in, in, in a, a, a class um alliance and so you know it creates a field of politics or to use the word from you know terms of anthony giddens who you know as a kind of power container that you do your politics on a national level right in a national organization and then ultimately into a nation state um which becomes a building block of the modern political you know global political order the nation state emerges in Europe in the 19th century, 19th century Europe is, you know, the map is redrawn uh, between, you know, 1815 and 1918. It's redrawn into a world of nation states. And then after decolonization, that becomes generalized. And so, like, that's why I'm often a little bit uh, skeptical of, of leftists who emphasize decolonization over class politics, is because decolonization functionally just meant the globalization of the nation state model that was the foundation of the capitalist order. Yeah. So let's bring that in, uh, into the examples, uh, you know, that we see, you know, under the late Ottoman empire and in, in the middle East, or, you know, just as well with around the same time, you know, with the Zionist movement, um, as I know much more about the Zionist part than I do about, you know, a lot of the Arab nationalist movements that were in the Middle East. And there was definitely a class component for the Zionist movement, you know, as far as Hebrew goes. And Hebrew was really something only understood by uh, the upper classes, uh, what they called the um, the mescaline, I think, the, the people who were looked at as bringing enlightenment to the Jewish world. Mm -hmm. And... That was a big debate about whether or not, you know, Hebrew should become uh, something important to the Zionist movement or if you could keep promoting Ladino or Yiddish or, you know, uh, Jewish Arabic or any of the other uh, dialects or whatever you want to call them. But uh, the other, you know, as far as when I look into the history of like, how did the Ottoman Empire administration uh and how did it eventually wind up pri taking on a, a system of privatized land and land titles and things like this that made it possible for any of this to even happen to begin with that's where it starts looking to me like uh you know capitalism is really a big part of the story that gets left out and i'd like to hear your your take on some of that well, when considering the population of the Ottoman Empire specifically, it's I think a good starting point is to understand that during you know when we use the term Ottoman Empire, it's a little misleading because it it kind of implies a continuity uh, between you know twelve ninety mythical foundation of the Ottoman state and its final termination in nineteen twenty four, and really the Ottoman Empire. Uh, or the Ottoman polity, perhaps, is a better term, you know, goes through various iterations. Its early phase is as, as a kind of tribal confederation on the frontiers. It evolves through military success into a relatively centralized feudal order. And then in the, you know, 17th and 18th century, uh, it becomes uh, in, in some ways more decentralized, but in some ways more uh, integrated. You have uh, the marketization of the economy, the emergence of an Ottoman middle class that, you know, was part of an imperial culture. Uh, you know, one of the fascinating aspects of the Ottoman state is that in the period of so-called decline, um, the Ottoman, uh, 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 you know, Ottoman culture and, and the Ottoman system still remains very important to provincial elites who don't like to listen to the sultan uh, you know it becomes a little bit more like a holy roman empire as opposed to a you know a highly centralized empire and then in the 19th century you have uh, basically the ottoman state conjures a bureaucratic state uh, into existence the exigencies for that are obviously there are external factors the increasing military pressure uh, 
uh, upon the Ottoman Empire in the late 18th century. You have a series of uh, very costly defeats at the hands of Russia. Then you have the Napoleonic invasion of Egypt. Uh, and uh, so, you know, obviously you have this, be you know, this uh, beginning of an attempt to reform, and central to that is reforming the apparatus of the state. And, you know, this over time, uh, you know, develops into a, a more thorough growing process of nation building, where the Ottoman state is attempting to build an Ottoman nation. And it's not building an Ottoman nation from nothing. There's already this kind of imperial uh, uh, middle class that exists across the town that sees itself as Ottoman in some way or another. And sorry, that was my dog. And um, so you have this, like, uh, you know, growing uh, Ottoman middle class. You have a kind of state tradition. So they are con uh, building this bureaucratic state and attempting to build a national identity. But of course, that means that they have to come to, to come to terms with the both religious and ethnic plurality and pluralism that exists in the Ottoman Empire. And so you have, you know, debates amongst state leaders over like what's the basis, or what should be the basis of an Ottoman identity during the kind of uh, 1830s to 1870s period. It's very liberal inspired, as it were, where it's an idea of a, a, an Ottoman identity based around co a common homeland loyalty to the sultan, and eventually the idea of a kind of shared constitution and shared political institutions. In the late 19th century, although that kind of civic Ottomanism is never fully abandoned, there's a stronger emphasis on the Islamic character of the Ottoman state. Uh, and then in the kind of final decade of the Ottoman Empire during the Young Turks period, there's an attempt to, you know, square Islamism, civic Ottoman nationalism, and a, a growing Turkic, uh, Turkish nationalist movement all together. And, you know, there are a lot, you know, the art from the state perspective, there are, you know, the state uh, recognizes plurality. Like in nine, people think of the young Turks as being these hardcore Turkish nationalists. But in 1914, they basically conceded all of the cultural autonomy rights to the Arabs right just before the war that, you know, you would have Arabic speaking officials and Arabic was already taught in the schools in the Ottoman Empire. There was an attempt by the state to promote uh, an official Ottoman nationalism, right? Now, Ottomanism, of course, it has its kind of Turkic tendency in it. It has its civic tendency in it, has its Islamic tendency in it. And it's also drawn upon by an emerging, uh, uh, a growing kind of middle class. Like there's a constituency for this Ottoman patriotism. And that is a kind of cosmopolitan Ottoman middle class that is uh, brought into existence by the process of reform and modernization. They build schools to educate people in modern science. When they teach them French to read the maths book, they don't just read the maths book, they read like Compte, philosophy, all these kind of stuff. And so these people come to see themselves as being, you know, the constituency of an Ottoman nation, which is being integrated primarily through the state as an institution, not through, you know, capitalism. But at the same time, uh, you know, there are kind of counter tendencies in this nation building process. For example, uh, you know, historically in the Ottoman Empire, you have uh, a system of communal autonomy for religious minorities. In the 19th century, there were two ways you could go with this, right? You could abolish it and say, no, everybody's an Ottoman citizen un uh, under the law. To a certain extent, that takes place. But at the same time, there's a kind of bureaucratization and modernization of this communal autonomy. So, for example, the rabbi of Istanbul, who was the head of the Jewish community in Istanbul, is transformed into the king of the Jews in the Ottoman Empire, like the head of the the head of a bureaucratic organization in in, in the Ottoman Empire. So this kind of bakes in so, sort of segmented fissures within the uh, Ottoman political project, which while not necessarily um, precluding the formation of a strong Ottoman identity, creates a potentiality for a different identity to emerge. Put it another way, 
uh, look at Britain as an example. You know, you have a process of nation building in Britain. You have the formation of a British identity. At the vanguard of that identity are Scots, right? Many Scots played an important role in early British nationalism. But Scotland maintains certain institutional peculiarities separate from the rest of Britain. And, uh, you know, so Scotland remains to be seen as a nation within this broader nation of Britain. And so, you know, at a different historical juncture, our present historical juncture, we're seeing instead of a kind of more integration, integrative focus, uh, Scotland is kind of sort of spitting off into its own kind of separate nationalism, uh, as it were. So, so these projects are never finished because, you know, very rarely do you get full, you know, complete well i well you do actually you get like certain identities just eliminated and steamrolled uh, but other identities can survive they can survive as a subnational identity um uh, only to reemerge at a later historical period as a, as a separatist nationalist movement in its own sense if that made sense and people are always reworking these identities even within the course of their own lives right you know in my research i, I you know i i follow like you know, Kurdish intellectuals who start off as patriotic Ottomans, uh, then they become Kurdish nationalists, and then they get kind of fed up and become Turkish nationalists, right? Uh, so people, you know, people change over their life. So these identities are constantly in a state of flux. So less, of, so a little bit less about the identities themselves and about the property relations mm -hmm. in Palestine during. I guess I think the year is 1856 or something that there's an the Ottoman land, land, the Ottoman land code of a, 1858 1858 okay. there's an Ottoman land uh, land code which a good way to think of it is like it's a rationalization process uh, so there were kind of modern aspects to it but Islamic aspects to it and basically you have these things called tapu which is, I guess is a title deed to a land and you know people had to register land right Right, uh, but obviously that process played out differently in different places, parts of the empire. Some parts of the empire, you know, elites could like con villagers out of their land by having all the land registered in their name. So, for example, you know, you have land that is communally held, and then right. uh, like a, a particular individual will just register that land in their name. Right. And, and you know, this happens over and over. This happens actually in Iraq under the British, where they just like hand over large amounts of land to uh, sheikhs in the Arab tribes, where the land had previously been communally held. Uh, but in some par some parts of the Ottoman Empire, the 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 peasantry does actually get the land in its name as well. So you you have a kind of a reg land registration, which makes it easier to buy and sell land. Uh, in the in, in the Ottoman Empire, it's kind of like the kind of foundations of a capitalist exchange of land. It's not quite the same. I think in a lot of cases, and I may be wrong about this, the land is still technically state land, and you're just getting use rights of it. But it does make it possible to buy and sell land uh, a lot easier, and also it creates this process of, of land registration in which people own land and can invest in it as a kind of precondition to the development of agriculture. I don't know Palestine so well, but I know, for example, in the Kurdish regions of the Ottoman Empire, uh, especially in the region around D Diyarbakir, um, you know, in the early 20th century, there was enormous amount of uh, you know, agricultural development taking place. Uh, around there because you had these large landowners who were beginning to invest more heavily in sort of modernizing the agricultural system, uh, et cetera, et cetera. You had, of course, a, also a significant degree of violence taking place over land, uh, 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 over land. Again, the conflict, uh, you know, if you look at British documents regarding the conflict between Kurdish tribes and Armenians in the late 19th and early 20th century, they talk about it as a land question because it's a question of who's getting land registered in their names. Kurdish tribes are using their military power, their connections with the state to basically intimidate and, um, and kind of expropriate their land and, 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 and set themselves up as big landowners. So this process of land registration, obviously uh, uh, in certain parts of the Ottoman Empire, uh, begins to sort of um, result in an intensification of struggle uh, 
over mm -hmm. control of this land. And obviously that's happening to a certain degree in, in, in Palestine before the fall of the Ottoman Empire, although the Ottomans were kind of, I think a lot of, uh, a lot of early Zionists who settled there had to take Ottoman nationality. Uh, yeah. So the way I understand it is basically, you know, Pal people living in Palestine had uh, a system of land use that was different from Lebanon. It was different from, you know, I think some of the other regions so it had some of its own unique features, but what this, um, the land registration process, a lot of the titles were given to sheikhs or they were, uh, um, I think the Ottoman state had a significant amount of the land registered to itself. And the, the, the big, uh, thing that sets off a bunch of the early conflicts between the Zionists and the, uh, the, uh, Arab Palestinians or maybe not even considering themselves Palestinian at the time was that the titles were given to absentee landowners. I mean, yeah, I mean this is very common. You had you had the land uh, land being given to absentee landowners in Damascus, in Beirut. Yeah. And and obviously they were selling their land out from underneath the peasantries. Uh, feet in many right. cases, and so yes, this is uh, this is a critical you know aspect of this uh, uh, process you know because a lot of the land you know the land before 1948 was purchased legally through yes. the Ottoman and then under the British uh, administrative system, but of course because of the class relations that existed in the Ottoman Empire at the time, the existence of absentee landlords, this you know ever you know you know th this meant that you know, land which farmers had been tilling for generations, first of all, was, you know, basically enclosed, as it were, by yeah. uh, by landowning elites uh, through the process of registration and then sold to a group that wanted to force them off the land. Right. So, exactly, which is, so the, the absentee landowners got huge compensation because the Zionists a lot of the time would bid up the land mm -hmm. so that uh it wouldn't be um attractive to other people who would want to buy it so they were willing to pay more for it than anyone else would but who who did that money go to the absentee landowner mm -hmm. meanwhile the tenant farmers got nothing uh well, they, they got booted off their land and then and then once the labor zionists decided well we can't hire Arab uh, farmers, we have to hire Jewish farmers. Then they got booted off their land. And then the Ottomans would protect that sale and break up all the riots and all the, uh, all the protests of uh, Palestinian Arabs that, that were obviously recognizing that this was fucked up. <laughs> and yeah, then I mean, uh, uh, Lewis, uh, what's his name? Fishman, who is a historian of uh, late Ottoman Palestine, talks about this, that this becomes an issue around 1910 and 1911. And the land question is a big question in the Ottoman Empire. You know, uh, you have the issues in Palestine, you have the issue of land reform uh, in the Armenian regions. You know, you had 30 years in which Kurdish tribes had been indulged in seizing Armenian lands. And then obviously this becomes a big question for the, you know, post-1908 Young Turk administration, which in its initial phase is a kind of liberal law and order, like uh, protect everyone's rights, uh, um, you know, politi uh, political organization. So land is an important question uh, for, 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 for the Ottoman state. Um, but of course, for, in Palestine, you know, in 1908, 1909, the Ottoman Empire was not, people weren't thinking the Ottoman Empire was going to disappear, right? Right. The, the Ottomans were, you know, just applying the law as it stood and I, that includes the zionists too as well i don't think they assumed that they would be in a situation where the ottoman empire would disappear yeah i mean that's so, another important that's another important thing to, to to realize you know the destruction of the ottoman empire was not necessarily something people thought was around the corner in 1910 you, right you know, 
people were trying to, you know, work with the system. But yeah, you have, I mean, like the process of modernization in the Ottoman Empire, you know, has an impact on the economy, has an impact on uh, communal relations, right? You know, this is a period in which, um, you know, the growing influence of European imperialism, of growing political and economic control exercised by the European great powers over the Ottoman administration is it understood by large segments of the population, not in terms of sort of secular imperialism, as we might understand it, but as, as, as a clash of civilizations about the, the kafirs coming and like dominating the Muslims. So like these, these, these conflicts in the Middle East were often refracted, although they have material origins, are refracted through sectarian uh, you know, politics. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think having a real good understanding of that before the British get involved, before the UN, the League of Nations, whatever, make an even further mess of everything, in my opinion, that uh, there was this resistance to, you know, basically, uh, I think before that kind of land registration process, use rights were based on usufruct, you know, mm -hmm. and um, it wasn't a system of private property in the capitalist sense that we know it. And uh, they had labor protests. They had real, like what you would see in England or what you would see in the United States. They, you know, were well aware that this was, uh, <laughs> um, it wasn't just religion, I guess is what I'm going to say. And it wasn't just uh, uh, imperialism. It wasn't, it wasn't, but it, there was also a labor relation and a class relation and a, uh, a conflict that I think mutually militarized both uh, Zionists and Arab nationalists. As uh, so, the Haganah formed from basically uh, Jews trying to replace the Ottomans as the defenders of their property or whatever. And yeah, I mean, so long as the Ottoman state existed, you know, the Ottoman state had some kind of legitimacy. After in 1908, you know, there was an election, they had a parliament, right? There were representative bodies that existed. Uh, in the empire, Jewish people were elected to the parliament of the Ottoman Empire. So yeah. you uh, you you have you have a political process taking place. You have a civil society, uh, you know, working through it. Uh, but you know, obviously, that kind of experimenting constitutionalism after the 1908 revolution fails. And you know, critical. The you know the the watchword of 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 the 1908 constitutional revolution had been the constitution and a shared political institution will resolve all our problems like all this communal stuff all this like uh, all this like imperialism that we suffer from this will be resolved once we have representative institutions because it's the fact that we don't have those representative institutions that is creating the communal strife that is uh, allowing the imperialists to screw with us uh, but for a variety of reasons, that revolution fails. And really, the whole history of the Middle East since 1908 has been a history of the failure of the liberal revolution in the Middle East. Yeah, I, my best friend that I grew up with is uh, Persian. And his dad came to the United States as, he, as a communist who left in the 70s during the revolution for obvious reasons. Um, and so I, I have some familiarity with the way that uh, there's been this these huge shifts throughout the Middle East between liberal, secular ideas, even socialist and communist ideas, and uh, religious fundamentalism in one way or another. And so, you know, I get frustrated when I see all sorts of people kind of homogenize the Middle East and look at it as like this, you know, re like overly religious, anti-scientific, anti-rational kind of place when 
it's, you know, parallel developments of the Nada with the Enlightenment and the Haskala, like, was having the same impact there as everywhere else. Yeah, I mean, you see a lot of the same tendencies in the in the Middle East as, as you do in Europe during the time, right? You know, you have, like, in the mid-19th century, you have the Tanzimat in the Ottoman Empire, which, you know, is a kind of liberal reform movement. And then after 1870s, you see the kind of conservative shift in politics, which we see in Europe. You know, that's the Bismarck era. That's the conservatives in Britain. You go to America, that's Porfirio Diaz in Mexico, crushing the liberals in Mexico and, and creating a dictatorship. The Ottoman Empire is following those trends, right? It's following right. it's following those global trends. Um, and, you know, uh, and, you know, even with the kind of shift towards Islamism after the 1870s in the Ottoman Empire, that has to be understood within two processes. A, Islamism in the modern sense, pan-Islamism emerges in response to imperialism. And it's rather, you know, people think of it in terms of, you know, it's the caliphate, it's, no, like pan-Islamism is basically a Muslim equivalent of pan-Slavism or pan-Germanism, where, you know, they're trying to forge a, a, a nation out of the Islamic community, out of the ummah, which is not like a ridiculous idea if you think about it, because that's kind of a very strong identity. Uh, and so they're trying to transform that into a kind of basis for, you know, anti-imperialist action. Uh, so that's one aspect. And then also the other aspect is in 1876, 1877, uh, the Ottoman Empire is defeated by Russia, loses a lot of territory in Europe, and suddenly the empire's ethnic makeup is a lot more Muslim. So it makes sense yeah. to kind of uh, emphasize that Islamic aspect of the uh, of the state. But of course, that has the colliery of polarizing other uh, uh, identities. Uh, so you know, it's a it's a it's a funny game. Every time, you know, it's like whack, being being a nation builder is like whack a mole. Every time you do one thing, you'll end up annoying somebody else. I know. Yeah, it's like when I so the early like um, I think one of the early Palestine. Palestinian political groups was actually like half Muslim, half Christian, uh, in, in that period that we're talking about. And yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> I mean, it is, it's definitely not, you know, the picture gets really distorted when we sort of anachronistically look at like Hamas or something and think that that's always just been Hamas or even the yeah. PLO. Um, so what, so <sighs> When we, by the time we get to World War One with the League of Nations, and uh, the consequences of like these different agreements that um, were being made between, you know, whether it's uh, the Balfour Declaration or whether it's the Sykes Pico whatever agreement or the whatever the one was called with uh, Husseini, I believe his name was. Yeah. So the Hussein McMahon correspondence is what you talk. Yeah, about. I, I feel like by the time we get to that point, that there is this overwhelming preference for uh, national self determination is sort of like the watchword of the League of Nations, mm -hmm. and their ideal, at least publicly, is that they're going to give a mandate to the French and the British until there's a viable nationalist movement that could, sorry, a nationalist movement that could create a viable state. And what it looks like to me is that there was indeed people advocating for a Palestinian independent state. However, it looks like what the League of Nations and the British were more concentrated on were these other people who didn't necessarily want an independent Palestine. They wanted like uh, Jordan or Syria or Egypt to control the region. And I think there's, there's this interesting competition between different groups for what was going to be done with Palestine, whether or not Israel was created that, I think is missing from the discourse, but it's important because it resulted in uh, 
an inability to agree to a plan? Well, I think the fundamental issue comes down to this. The, you know, the, the, there's one of the interesting ac- aspects of empire building in the 19th century is that in contrast to other historical eras, a lot of empire building was done by states whereby the process of empire building was really in contradiction to their core ideological propositions, right? You're like, there's no contradiction between the Mongols building an empire and being the Mongols, right? Right. However, there is a kind of contradiction if you're like liberty, egality, fraternité is your ideology and you're building an empire, right? And there was always that tension. By, by the end of the First World War, that tension really begins to kind of unravel. And what the system, you know, the British and the French wanted to do a land grab in the Middle East. But by the end of the First World War, doing such a naked land grab, which would have been doable, let's say, 20 years earlier, which mm-hmm. is not politically feasible. So they come up with this fiction mandate system whereby they can have colonies but not call them colonies and say they're actually preparing these people for nationhood. So what happens is that the Middle East gets partitioned. You know, it's not that there was like a, a, a necessary like a pan, you know, uh, uh, Arab state from Basra to Baghdad to uh, Damascus in the waiting. But what happens is that there are attempts uh, the leaders of the Arab revolt take Damascus and they t- attempt to build a state, right? And, uh, you know, this is like for all its flaws, it's kind of an indigenous attempt to build a state on the wreckage of the old Ottoman Empire, right? But this right. is crushed. Uh, the British allow the French to go in and wipe this experiment out. And what is created in its place are these mandates, which are basically, you know, borders are drawn, you know, State institutions are created, even some democratic institutions, not in Palestine, but in places like Iraq, you know, you have parliaments and stuff. Uh, But these are like crippled, you know, these are like crippled institutions imposed from the outside with little domestic buy-in, right? Uh, You know, uh, 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 the first king of Iraq, Hussein, you know, complains that, you know, uh, there's no Iraqi patriotism. Everyone's just like, fragmented there's no sense of broader nationality uh, at the process so you have these kind of crippled processes uh, uh these crippled states being created had to say for example being able to build a state in damascus uh following the end of the first world war that state might have been stronger because it would have had it would have been forged through if not a revolution but through like a significant indigenous mobilization rather than an external uh, in position, if that if that makes sense, right? Yeah. So you, you have these you have these states which you know people go oh they're artificial states. Well, all states are artificial, you know. Like borders don't like just appear naturally on the world, uh, the surface of the world, but they do by saying they're artificial states. Even though it's kind of a misleading terminology, it does kind of get there's a kernel of something to do to do that. These were basically. Uh, you know, imposed largely from outside, right? These borders were largely driven uh, by outside imperial interests, right? Um, right. Uh, there is a process of negotiation to a certain extent. You know, the the British and the French don't aren't completely able to redraw the map of the Middle East according to their will. Their plans to partition Anatolia fail. The Saudis, you know burst out of the desert, set up those states. And interesting enough, if you look which of the states that are the strongest in the Middle East, it's those which were formed through kind of more indigenous mobilization than, for example, you know, like states that were, you know, created by the imperialists, uh, conjured by the imperialists out of thin air. Yeah, whose whose interests obviously were not necessarily... uh the same as the people who would supposedly have the power in those uh, after, after and the what mandate. and what happens in the uh, in in Palestine is quite interesting you know uh they give the, what becomes Jordan they give that off to a Hashemite to buy him off Hashemite right. like where's my kingdom and they're like here have this piece of desert over here and then what happens in in, in the mandatory Palestine is that the British reify the ethno-sectarian 
lines, which they don't create, right? You know, this is a this is like a misnomer. You know, like Lebanon, for example, those sectarian divisions existed before, but the French made it worse, right? By right. Like, by institutionalizing it even to an even greater degree. What happens in in, in, um, in Palestine is you have a kind of um, you have a Jewish administration, a state within a state. Then you have a mandatory mm -hmm. administration, and basically it's a kind of very undemocratic uh, uh, system. So there are no shared institute. You know, there there aren't these kind of shared institutions which might have served as a basis for the integration of the uh, uh, you know um, Jewish, Christian, and Muslim populations. You know, into a kind of let's say uh, non-sectarian form of Palestinian nationalism, right? Which, which is, you know, on the ground is, it's not, it wasn't absolutely segregated between these groups in the urban centers. Yeah, but they create these institutions which segment society. They do, the British do a similar thing in Iraq. It's just, it's less on sectarian lines and more on the line between countryside and between tribal zone and uh, like places that are not tribal zones, right? Where you, where you have like two systems of law operating in the country. So you have these, you have these states which are supposed to be nation states in in, in waiting, but the colonial administration, you know, because it's it doesn't give a crap about integrating these things, and it's kind of operates a, whether intentionally or not, is operating a kind of divide and rule where they're like, okay, we'll set up all these like communal institutions, which further exacerbates tensions because it reifies those differences between uh, uh, ethnic and national co uh, uh, communities. It like stops them from integrating. It doesn't give them experience of working together in liberal political institutions. And so, you know, you end up with these kind of uh, crippled, I like to think of them as crippled nation building process. Same thing in Syria. Sectarianism in Syria is uh, turned up to 11 by the French through the way that they administer the Syrian mandate. And the same applies in Palestine, where you have, you know, uh, basically two parallel administrations: one for the Arabs, one for the uh, one for the Jews. And the British are always playing a balancing act between, you know, uh, you know, initially, you know, uh, one of the big arguments I have with my uh, uh, Zionist colleagues in Middle East studies is that, you know, they get really upset when you say, well, you know, Zion when you go, well, Zionism wouldn't have been possible if it wasn't for British imperialism. But it's indisputable that, like, you know, that provided the opportunity, because the argument goes, well, after 1939 and the White Paper, they stopped Jewish immigration. So, yeah, but they, you know, had opened up the country to Jewish immigration in the first place, right? Right. So, uh, yeah, I mean, th there are, this is all diplomatic, you know, make trying to just get people to behave. Whether had, or not they allowed the immigration or not, and had you uh, had if, had you had democratic institutions in Palestine after the First World War, things may have developed very differently, right? I I really I really think they would have, and I I along I with the think, property, I don't think Jewish people would have moved to Israel. They they wouldn't have necessarily wanted to move, right? Well. Yeah. If you if you look at the before the you, Holocaust no. before the before the Holocaust, um, but if you look at where people went from Russia, when at the height of the barbarism of the Black Hundreds and what Jewish people across the Russian Empire, some went to but most went to the United States, right? Which is my my family is which uh, makes sense because it was because like this is one thing I think is really important to understand or something something that I've come to like un, uh, think about and I think is right you know when people talk about a nation state protecting a national community right they miss the what's protecting the national community it's not the nation state it is the liberal how liberal that state is if israel was not a jewish democracy why would anyone move to it the only people who'd live there would be the Mazrahi Jews who have nowhere else to go, right? Yeah. It had to be it, it's those liberal freedoms that 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 make an attractive place to live. Yeah, the other the other, you know, uh I think if we when I look at the timeline of the way Zionism develops and the timeline uh it seems to me that you know, 
the militarization and the move, the winning out of the right wing of the Zionist movement and all of these things. Uh, it's, it seems like it uh, has could have been preventable in a lot of different ways. And one of those, the primary way, at least the way I think about it, is that when you have conflicts and war, it leads to militarization and uh, authoritarianism in one way or another. And that those I'm- conflicts were, um, you know, partially from mismanagement of land titles, partially from uh, diplomatic screwing around but with, uh, you know, different different groups of Jews and Arabs. And uh, it's, I think it's pretty tragic and it's, I don't, I like, and what it leads me to think is that there really is a necessary distinction to make between ideology and process Mm -hmm. Um, where people, you know, on the left right now want to say Zionism is fundamentally settler colonialism, depending on how you define that term. You could say yes, you could say no, you could look at this period at the beginning or this period in the middle or this period now. But I think once you start mixing process, which is settler colonialism with ideology, which is values and these vague, you know, kind of like uh, identity things, you you miss something about where solutions can be uh looked for yeah Yeah, i mean i mean i do find it you know you have all these people in the united states going like all israelis are legitimate targets because it's settler colonial states well do you want to go to a baseball stadium and then allow yourself to be gunned down by an apache in order to like you know what does that even mean settler colonialism I think it's very legitimate to look at it as an analytical tool. And there's a moral dimension to it too, right? But a lot of nations have settler colonial aspects to them. England was doing settler colonialism in Ireland, right? Um, You know, it's a bad thing. It's bad. It's a nasty process, right? But transforming that analysis into like a moral thing, like, well, everybody just, you know, like hack them all down, right? Let's go full Mau Mau on them. And like, uh, while you're watching the, uh, you know, battle for Algiers, A, it's bloody lapping. That's what it is. It's like, first of all, like the military balance of power is so in favor of Israel, encouraging these counter, and now I call them counter pogroms, like Hamas's counter pogrom to what Israel's sure. been slow rolling. Um, we don't want to support pogroms. Even if, like, even if you understand why people might want to do a pogrom, right? It it's like that's not the kind of political a- action we need to be supporting. And where does it really get you, right? You know, as much as it, like the like Israeli na- like the Zionist project or Israeli nationalism or the Israeli national the the Israeli state and political elites response to Gaza, you know, actually the problem is like it sh- it shouldn't be condemned uh, on the basis that it's quote unquote colonial. The problem, you know, from the working class, if the Israeli state wanted to go in to Gaza and the West Bank, annex those people and force them to become citizens of the state of Israel, I mean, it would be like that's pretty bad, like not respecting national self determination. But if they were given the citizenship right and integrated into the Israeli economy, whether they liked it or not. It would be like, just like, you know, the Ukraine war, where it's like a, it, it's like a, a state fight over land, right? Israel should be condemned because it, uh, because its project does not want to freaking integrate those people. It wants to freaking boot them out into the ether of nowhere. That's where the condemnation should be. Not because it's inherently a colonial project. I mean, as it were, although I guess you could say settler colonialism is to a certain extent about booting out indigenous people. But the fundamental problem of what's good, like, it would be better, from my perspective, for Israel to go in there, annex annex Gaza, and then just force everyone to be a, a, an Israeli citizen, whether they like it or not, uh, than what I, they're doing now. I, 
I think a lot of people who really understand the dynamics going on there are saying that I'm my, I'm not as familiar with the recent history as I am with the older history. Mm. And I, you know, when I see a lot of the arguments about what's happening now, I feel like, you know, I can't be a referee in something I don't have much insight into. Uh, well, I could definitely condemn the most obvious atrocities, but. I mean, atrocities, I mean, like, first of all, it's like, hey, we don't really need to. When this thing happened on on Nova, uh, on October the 7th, I was like, oh, this is going to be terrible, right? Initially, yeah. I thought it was like, you know, oh, this is just like a flash in the pan. But it looked, then suddenly it becomes this big attack. I'm like, people are going, oh, yeah, this is like, I was like, this is going to end up exactly where it's fucking is now. Like, yeah, this is going to end thought. badly. I was like, this is going to end with like thousands of dead kids. Because the Israelis, for all this like propaganda about them giving a crap about, like, yes, there are constraints on the barbarism of the Israelis. Perhaps some of those constraints are even domestic. But the majority of those constraints on what Israel is doing is because they don't want to piss off all the Arabs around them, especially those Arab dictators like in Egypt and in Saudi Arabia who have to contend with poor Palestinian population. I, I think, of course, if the Israelis had their way, they would not, as a first choice, want to bomb all the Palestinian children. They'd want to all send them off to the Sinai Desert to go live in Egypt so then they can take on, uh, on Hamas. But yeah, like it's like really barbaric stuff. But of course, that's the logic of pogroms and counter pogroms, right? That's going to be the, yeah. uh, it's the, until you can surpass that logic, I mean, it's going to be a race war. And in a race war, um, the Palestinians are going to be bearing the brunt of that cause, uh, of that war. You can make life inconvenient for the Israelis, but you can make life hell for the Palestinians. And, and you know, what gets me is like, look, I'm not going to say anything about like, you know, people in Palestine, about how they feel about this whole thing. But, you know, you're outside of the, maybe don't be like treating this like DM sport where it's like, oh yeah, yeah. Look, look at this, look at that. It's like, you know, a good example is like the um, Eugene Perrier, who's like a journalist who I think does good work sometime. So went to this Palestine rally and yeah, those people at the rave, they freaking got what they deserved. I can get the impulse of that to a certain degree where you're like, what the fuck are these people doing? Like the thing I would say is like, what the hell do you think you're doing having a rave three miles from like this, like, uh, atrocity of Gaza, but being a kind of like oblivious asshole shouldn't be a death sentence, right? <laughs> you right. know what I mean? It's like you could say, well, these people perhaps they were oblivious assholes having a rave right next to like a what David Cameron called an open prison. I get that, and I get like, well, you know, a, a kind of like emotional response. But like, if you just think about it for two minutes, you're like, asshole shouldn't con condemn you to death, right? And I mean, it's you just, know, and, and what's the, the details, purpose? What's like, the purpose? What does it serve? It serves, it, it, it's more about emotional catharsis. Like a lot of people in the West, I think this is my psych, pop psychoanalysis. Like they, they freaking hate their like cozy, wozy life in the West and things like that. They deep down hate themselves. And so like watching Hamas kill people at a rave is like, it's like an attack on the thing that they hate in themselves, which is well, like hedonism. A lot of, and, I have a suspicion that a lot of people who uh, weren't uh, very empathetic with that situation don't like raves to begin with, <laughs> no matter where they are. That's, um, that's true. They are very loud. Yeah, they're loud and they're they're hippies or they're you know they're 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 tech bros or they're something you know the idea like it's the way people talk about Burning Man here. I think yeah, some of I, that is kind of transposed onto what that must have been. Yeah, because I think, you know, a lot of people interpreted it as a kind of anti-Semitism. And I was like, actually, I don't think this is anti-Semitism. I think this is actually like a cult. That's like people hate that kind of like um, decadence, as it were. I think there was yeah. a kind of, there is a kind of like a, a Stalinist asceticism amongst the left, which like, you guys are having too much of a good time and you're doing it right next to an open air prison. So paraglider time, you know what I mean? Right. Um, I, that, that's the impression I get. Um, that's what I, that's what I get too. Yeah. It's like, it's, it's a hatred for like luxury. 
Um, as far as you know, socialism, small s socialism. You know, I I assume you're not an anarchist from what I've seen. Um, but we could, I think you could fit into the the broader category of uh, socialism. Um, what what is you know what are some of the things we could look at besides like you know, what happened with property relations, you know, a uh, hundred years ago or whatever. And, um, you know, I think it's important to see, you know, to talk about what did happen to the left in Israel. Why did it get so, you know, why are there left wingers leaving Israel all the time? Like, how did it become such a right wing shithole? And, uh, you know, things like that. And what happened to socialism broadly in the Arab world? Right. Um, I don't I don't feel like people are talking about that enough. And the I, popular uh, front happened. That's what happened. <laughs> you know, lo- in a lot of places around the Middle East, a the popular front happened. The socialists rallied behind left, quote unquote, left wing nationalists and then subsequently got all killed. I'm less familiar with the situation in Israel, but it's it follows more of the it f- follows the broader global trends. Right. You have the you know the rise of socialism in the Middle East. You know in Iraq, Iran, you have very large communist parties, right? Uh, uh, but these are like crushed because of politics. Like they they lose out in a battle of politics. You know maybe the Iraqi Communist Party couldn't have won. Maybe they could have won. I don't know. But certainly this political strategies they pursued in like between 1958 and and, and, and 1963 left them vulnerable to bull. To being purged maybe you know maybe the roots of that uh before then or whatever same thing with the iranian left you know when the islamic revolution happened it, it, some elements of the iranian left uh, rallied behind the uh islamist and some did not but the movement was divided right um uh, 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 uh over the issue of taking power so like i think politics comes down to it you know like these movements failed right they f- they maybe they didn't have the like political base to w- succeed in the first place in some places, but you know maybe the reason that they were in those positions in the first place because they made bad political choices. So like they were defeated uh, regionally, and then broader there were the like global trends which kind of um, you know pushed you know class based politics to the periphery. I mean. Is is the rise of Islam in, Islam in in the Middle East, which is coterminous with the rise of neoliberalism, is that really different? A different historical process from the rise of identity politics in America. I mean, right. obviously, it's very different context, but you know, people retreating to you know peculiarism uh, in a response to the failure of these universalistic pro, uh, uh, <coughs> uh, projects, right? Yeah, and I know. It, in Israel, you know, there used to be a, at least a facade of liberal Zionism as this being a, like a democracy and things like that. You know, I have some fr- family friends who, you know, uh, were from England and when they retired, they they did Alia, went to Israel. And like, they're just posting stuff like, we're not flattening Gaza because we hate them, but because we know our history and it's like them or us, you know. It's just become that kind of thing. And that's like the axis of politics. That's why I'm critical of all this like race first uh, politics in the United States, because it's just like the same paradigm as white supremacy, except with the goodies and baddies are like flipped on their head. So, you know, of course, Saki's settlers book is basically just the Ku Klux Klan narrative of history, except the black people are the good guys. Well, and if you look at like, you know, some like black anarchist writers today trying to deal with the legacy of black nationalism and stuff like that, you know, they'll make a lot of these same criticisms too, that when you, when you try to form these sort of nationalist uh, movements, you, you wind up, you know, just creating an inverse of the problem you're fighting and things like that. Exactly. I mean, this is one of my pet, one of the things I would say, I mean, like, had you know nazism being defeated zionism may well have gone the way of separatist black nationalism you know because you know if you look at the black movement you know you had this difference between separatists and integrationists and people always posit malcolm x as being the more radical 
like guy for criticizing civil rights, but he was criticizing civil rights from the right, right? He was yeah. he was criticizing it from the fact that it was not a black first movement. What what is what is the ultimate endpoint of Malcolm X's radicalism? It's just like right wing politics, which ironically is the end point of even like quote unquote left wing Zionism ended up becoming right wing in the end. Yeah. Or, or, uh, I don't know how much, I mean, the Bundists, the Jewish labor Bund mm -hmm. were autonomists at, in American language. That would be separatist. I mean, there was territorialists who did not consider right. themselves Zionists, but, uh, a lot of the socialist uh, Jewish movements wanted a autonomous Jewish region, and you know Stalin they thought gave that him, Stalin gave him one in Siberia, a swamp in yeah. Siberia on the Mongol border. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I think that's pretty correct. That if uh, you know, if all those more socialistic strands of, well, I don't know, modern Jewish politics weren't wiped out uh you probably would just see something more like a separatist movement within all those different countries yeah like uh, some kind of like uh communal recognition civil recognition in civil society you know like i mean generally that's how i think the national question needs to be resolved not through the creation of nation states but through uh allowing uh you know people the political freedom to organize in civil society for the promotion of their national culture or whatever it is but yeah we, I, we should avoid policies that reify those differences like you don't uh, want to have you don't want to have a consociational system like in lebanon where it sounds fair off the bat where it's like oh well you know the sunnis get this position shias get this position the christian gets to be this position the orthodox that sounds kind of fair, but then it's like reifying those differences. Because what if you don't want to be a freaking Orthodox or a Muslim or a Shia? What if you want to be a Buddhist, right? You don't right. get, you know, like we should be, we should be, you know, pushing bourgeois democracy to its like the hardest extent, as it were. You know, like pushing it as far as it can go uh, in in uh, abolishing distinctions between ethnic and na national groups. Now, obviously there are places where you have to make compromises, like people should be allowed to use their own language in public life. People should have, be able to have access to education in their own public life, but we should avoid things whereby, you know, you're, you have like, this is the school for the Jews. This is the school for the Armenians, you know, like, let yeah, I think we should be looking for ways where, people can be integrated with one another, but cultural differences can be respected and celebrated. How you do that in, in, in practice is a difficult question, but I think it's something we should be working towards. But if, if, if the history of the last hundred years have taught us everything, uh, national self-determination and the formation of new nations doesn't usually solve national questions. It creates new national questions. You know, Eric Hobsbawm says, you know, it's not, nations that make nationalisms and states but nationalisms and states that make nations you probably should have added they also sometimes make the wrong nation by treating certain people so badly they come to see themselves as a nation uh, um let's wrap this up on you know the i think uh, the global question on this is you know as a westphalian system or like a global nation state system is there room for non-nation states to get recognition like we see you know with uh northeastern uh uh, uh rojava or whatever northeastern syria and i don't know who if anyone has recognized them as a, a like legitimate sovereign entity or what that looks like in in the global picture right now but that's a different angle i think that's worth talking about as well i mean ultimately i think all like in the current global or capitalist order i think you can't really not be in it right uh everyone has to play the game of nations 
right now sometimes you can like build a federation uh you can you can have a cosmopolitan nation an, an idea of a an, a political nation formed out of many cultural nations people can envisage ha- what the national community is in different ways but ultimately as a kind of global uh, system it requires you to work as a nation state i mean look what happened to the soviet union right <clears throat> union you know i think often like Orthodox Leninists or Trotskyists will like blame everything on Stalin, which you know obviously you can blame Stalin for a lot of things. But um, the fact is, once the revolution in Western Europe failed, the Soviet Union had to start acting in the global system as a nation state, right? Right. And that meant internally and externally. In, uh, internally, it meant well they had to deal with the cultural diversity. What was that? They discovered, actually, it's not really easy to define who's a nation, so we'll just build the nations. So they built nations within the Soviet Union in order to build the building blocks of this Soviet identity. And externally, in order to survive in the global system, they had to subordinate the interests of, let's say, the Turkish communists, the Chinese communists, to the national interests of the Soviet Union as a nation state operating in an international system. So even uh, even you know during the Leninist period when we might say there was a good faith attempt to kind of overcome the nation state and create a new basis for political order ultimately you know the isolation of the Russian revolution structurally forced the Soviet Union to become a nation state and operate as a nation state within the international order. So do you have an op- option to get out of that system? Not really, right? Rojava is not recognized by anyone. Uh, and the US military interfaces it not as a political entity, but for its military commander, right? right. So, so no, you can't. You, you can maybe do what the Zapatistas did and like, you know, go up to some hills and stuff and do this. You can get into some marginal places. But until there's a radical transformation in the global political order and the economic structures, uh, you know, I don't think we can get out of the nationalism game. And this is one of the things I'd say about the left is that, you know, they've so internalized nationalism that, like, internationalism for a lot of people on the left is just supporting other people's nationalisms. I mean, yeah, it's crazy. It's a, uh, it's a real um, disconnect. It's, like, it's actually that it's like ironically, so many of these like uncritical, you know, like anti-imperialists are literally just like anti-Deutsches, you know. Yeah, and and if you look at like you know when internationalism uh, was doing better, you know, or whatever, you know, the first international times or around then you the way that people identified and behaved was not what we're seeing today when it comes to these ideas of internationalism i mean you had people going all over the place giving their speeches in whatever country you know this is why we have anarchism in in chile or or whatever like because malatesta went down there and just like the internationalism was a real um uh, it had its own soul, I guess. I mean, this is even with the Bolsheviks, right? Like one of the things that I think uh, I find uh, the baby leftists don't get is like you do realize, right? Like Lenin's plan was not socialism in one country, right? Like, like after the revolution failed to spread to Western Europe, like it was kind of like Lenin didn't know what to do because the plan failed, right? Yeah, the plan had failed. It's like, and and people can't get that through their head because they still think of it as like, oh, it's the Russian National Revolution. Whereas that, there was a whole debate between Plakhanov and and, and Lenin about, you know, Lenin uh, Plakhanov was like, can't do socialism in Russia because obviously you would have Incan industrialization, it would take violence and stuff. And Lenin's response is n- not, no, we can build socialism in Russia. Lenin's response is like, we'll have a revolution in Russia. So we can be the base of the revolution in the world, right? Whether you agree with the Bolsheviks or not is beside the point. It's like they were thinking as part of an international movement. They weren't thinking in terms of a national revolution. And that is something that uh, the legacy of Stalinism has completely obscured on the left. Yeah. Well, I hope that, uh, you know, people start thinking about this stuff. I hope this video we just did helps.
And I really appreciate you coming on here and, uh, you know, being able to bring everything you've studied to bear on this. Uh, because like I said, I just don't think the people have the, the categorical structure in their mind in order to deal with this, uh, this conflict in Israel and Pal- Israel, Palestine effectively. Well, I hope uh, I hope uh, your listeners appreciate uh, the time you've taken to set this up. So I thank you so much for your time, and uh, I hope we can speak again soon. Absolutely. All right. Take care, Gene. You too.